safety related? What was, was told to me was uh, we were working um, uh, an operation at, at a gun show. Um, our agents uh, observed someone that looked suspicious pushing a baby carriage with a couple of um, long guns in it. Uh, they followed her out to the parking lot um, where she actually transferred that to an individual, and our agents saw a transfer of money. Um, we had other agents follow the car that had the guns now out of the parking lot, um, pulled him over, did a traffic stop, identified him as a multiple convicted felon with not only the two guns this woman gave her, but also a third gun. Uh, we also um, confronted the woman, uh, and she confessed that uh, she was paid to, uh, to purchase these weapons. Uh, I believe it was a Saturday or Sunday when this happened. Uh, Bill relayed to me that uh, that was, that was uh, presented to the duty agent in, uh, in Phoenix, and uh, uh, they suggested that we take the case to state court. Thank you. I'm going to yield back to uh, the ranking member at this point in time. Thank you very much. We will ask that you also have another 30 seconds. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Special Agent Newell, um, I, I want to go back to something that the Chairman asked you, because I, I want to make, I want us to be real clear, and this is for the benefit the, of the entire committee. I have got to, I am trying to figure out what your definition of walking guns is. Maybe that is part of the problem. I think we, because I think almost everybody up here has our opinion about this, and I am just wondering if there is a difference between your definition of walking, allowing guns to walk, and ours. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to answer that. My definition of walking, and I believe it is a common, um, a common law enforcement term, is when a law enforcement agency, be it ATF, be it DEA, be it a State and Local Agency, actually puts some sort of evidence into the hands of a suspect in furtherance of an undercover operation, in furtherance of an investigation, and then does nothing to, um, it, it, with, the, with that property, that property, that either the, for instance, with ATF, it could be a prop gun, one of our evidence guns. You put it in the hands of that suspect and then don't take, um, you don't, don't do the follow-up, don't attempt to determine where that front gun is going. So you don't, you don't think there was any walking allowed in this, based on that definition in this case? Based on that definition, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we now go to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Newell, I, you know, one of my colleagues on the other side brought it up about uh, new laws. Now, I want to emphasize it wasn't the gun sales operator. And let me emphasize that again. It wasn't, was it? Because they were alarmingly bringing forth these sales, were they not? Okay, I'm sorry. Congressman, uh, here we go again. No, well, I, I didn't. It, it seems like this is the Mo Curley and Larry show, and we're looking for Larry. I mean, it's, it's, distru it's, it's disruptive to actually see what I'm seeing here. As a business person coming from uh, Main Street America, to actually see what I'm seeing here, you've got to be disgusted about this. And to go around and around the, kernel, the corner, I, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. Agent Canino. I, I watch your body language. I am a, a health care physician. Yes, sir. Okay? I watch body language like crazy. Tell me what you disagree with that man right there. On this specific case? Yes. Everything. Talking about records. How about records? Let's talk about records. Are there adequate records being kept? At the FFLs? Yep. Yes, sir. And how about how they relate between the sale of these guns and Mexico? Can we choreograph that? Yes, sir. I think, I think ATF does a great job in, in regulating the firearms industry. But in this case, in tracking, did they actually, were they able to track them? They had no idea where they were going. No, were sir. They? Only re the reason, the re you've got to put this in context. They're, everybody's saying, oh, this case was so big, it was complicated. Firearms trafficking cases are not complicated, Thank sir. You. Okay? They are not complicated. The reason this case was so big was because we didn't do anything. That's right. Plain and simple. Everybody wants to make this bigger than it is. Like I said earlier, you don't have the. I spent 19 years, 15 as a street agent, four leading a street group. Okay, you don't have the luxury or the right, in my opinion, as an ATF agent, to say I like this law, I like that law. Okay, that's you guys set the law, we follow it. Now it's up to me as an ATF agent how best to 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 produce uh, to make up an investigative technique and best practices. So I can make a case 
and present it to the U.S. Attorney. I have done my job. Now, it is up to the U.S. Attorney if he wants to prosecute it or not. I am going to bring him the best case I can. In this case, like I said earlier, we have the ATF trafficking guidelines and best practices, and we just threw it out the window. Nobody got stopped. It's in, like I said earlier, it's, how can you let somebody buy 730 guns, and at what point are you going to stop them? I mean, well, you would even just I, uh, wait, I, am, I've, I, I am embarrassed, sir. I have agents, guys who I consider American heroes, my friends, who I, mean, I never thought I would hear this, who they have told me since this broke, Carlos, I am ashamed to carry an ATF badge. To me, I have cried over that, literally, and I am not ashamed to say that. That this is, this is not a job to me. It's a profession. I don't have a hobby. This, I, my hobby is being an ATF agent. I love this job. I hit the lottery when I came on. And I am proud of what I do, and I am proud of the ATF agents in this country. We have heroes. We really do. But, and I have been watching your body language, too, and Mr. Burton's. Um, I am sorry, sir, but that is all I can say. I, I, have, I have no other way to describe this. Well, I mean, I look at this, and I look at, you know, you know when we are doing medical procedures, we look at what what's our end game and what is all the processes in between. And there is collateral damage. And the problem is the collateral damage is our crimes. And there are going to be deaths like we just saw, and there are going to be many more. And they are on this side and they are on that side. And you know what that tells me? That tells me that when we were in this planning stage, we got a problem. It is not on the field. It is right there in the office, in the head office of coming, up at, uh, coming up with this. This was absurd to even have this idea and to hear this merry-go-round back and bantering, back and around, where we can't get an answer after, after, from Mr. Newell. I mean, the buck stops with somebody. Who is it? It's obviously to me it's not these two gentlemen right here. I want to find out who Larry is. That's where we're going to have to go with this. But this is absurd. And that the fact that we used people's lives and their their um, and our and our, our friends from Mexico as pawns in this without even discussing that, how absurd and I, it, it's ever it, it's ever, ever, ever irreprehensible to even conceive of what's transpired here. And I hope the buck stops, and I hope you take a, a, uh, accountability all the way through, because this, this can't go on again. This is, I mean, both sides of the aisle are, are furious, and the American people ought to be furious at you. If this is what you, we get uh, for higher ups in, in ATF or in the Department of Justice, shame on you. Now you back to my I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Virginia uh, for his five minutes, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I'm sure all of uh, our panelists are so pleased to be here today. Um, I guess I have a slightly different take on the subject. Uh, I don't defend Fast and Furious, and I don't defend uh, the actions of the U.S. Attorney's Office at the time in Phoenix, and I certainly believe that it was a botched attempt that led to a tragedy, uh, perhaps many tragedies. And I think this committee and its chairman are right to raise those issues and, uh, and to uh, try to assign blame. But there is another part of the story I doubt very much the press will print in tomorrow's headlines, because it is so much easier to print who screamed the loudest at ATF and that you got beat up. But what the press won't print tomorrow, sadly, is the fact that Congress's hands are hardly clean on this subject. We have done everything to make sure that the F in ATF is nullified. We have made sure that you haven't got a permanent director for six years. We laud the private sector. What private company would think it is okay to lack a permanent CEO for six years? We have done everything in our power in Congress to try to defang the ATF to make sure that it is toothless. We have done everything we can to fight your budget and reduce it so that you don't have the resources to do the job. We are not criticizing you for not doing well. We had testimony before this committee by one of your colleagues, called by the committee majority, who said there are more New York police officers per square mile in New York than there are ATF agents in all of the State of Arizona. And yet somehow we are going to stop the hemorrhaging of arms trafficking going into Mexico with that kind of paltry set of resources. 
but that won't be in the headline tomorrow. Some of the loudest critics of ATF today are also on a bill misnamed the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Enforcement Act. What does that bill do? It allows firearms dealers to liquidate their inventories after having their arms dealer license revoked and would decriminalize gun sale record keeping violations, even if they contributed to cross-border gun trafficking. How does that help ATF and its mission? Where is the accountability here in Congress on this subject? It is easy to beat up on you. It is easy to look for a scapegoat when the agenda really is to make sure that we make it harder, not easier, to enforce gun trafficking. We had testimony from one of your colleagues before this committee who said there is more regulation on over-the-counter Sudafed than there is an arms trafficking going into Mexico. And he testified and was interrupted in this testimony, because it wasn't welcome, that he believed we needed to toughen enforcement laws as a tool for ATF to be able to fulfill its mission along the border. So I have no doubt that we can all pile on and correctly criticizing ATF for a botched mission. But what isn't said, and sadly what the press isn't going to bother to write about, but they should, is the fact that Congress, for six long years and maybe longer, has done everything in its power to make sure, in fact, you can't do your job. And this set of hearings needs to explore that, too. With that, I yield back the balance of my time to the ranking member. Uh, there, there is no, uh, currently no Federal statute that criminalizes firearm trafficking. <clears throat> Instead, traffickers are often prosecuted under 18 U.S.C. Section 922, which prohibits engaging in uh, firearms business without a license. Uh, the need for a Federal firearms trafficking statute was also a common refrain of law enforcement agents interviewed by the committee, as Mr. Connolly said. They told us that a dedicated firearms trafficking statute uh, would, would give them the ability to address patterns of activity by traffickers who divert firearms from legal to illegal commerce. Mr. Lenman, uh, based on your decades in law enforcement, do you believe a Federal firearms trafficking statute would be helpful in disrupting uh, the flow of guns to Mexi Mexican drug, drug cartels? Yes, sir. I have uh, viewed your proposed legislation. I agree with it wholeheartedly. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think might be added to that is a little more emphasis on uh, international trafficking. Maybe uh, if we can tighten it up a little bit as far as going to drug cartels. I, too, think that if you reach a certain amount of weapons, that could even be a life offense. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold, also a member who went to Mexico City. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I would like to take a moment to address something I heard before I asked the questions from the other side. They were talking about how much more difficult it is and how much more regulated the purchase of Sudafed is. I don't see anywhere in the Constitution where we are guaranteed the right to bear Sudafed, but we are guaranteed the right to bear arms. So I, I think that is an appropriate uh, or an inappropriate distinction. Um, Mr. McMahon, when my friend, the, the former prosecutor, the gentleman from South Carolina, uh, asked you uh, what the goal of this was, you said that it was to bring down a drug kingpin in Mexico. Is that a fair assessment? 